Good morning and welcome to today's Lord Mayor's Knowledge Miles Lecture on the remarkable evidence of how constructive or solutions driven journalism is gathering momentum around the world. I'm Charlotte Dorbrashley and I'm the manager of the FS Club at CN in the City of London. And it is a great privilege for me to introduce you to Sir Martin Lewis, CBE, who first called for the need for a better balance between positive and negative news coverage back in 1993. Today, he'll be returning to this topic to see how far constructive journalism is starting to take off in the world. I'm sure you're all familiar with Sir Martin's distinguished career across three fields, media, charity, and the corporate world. A quick highlights recap is that he spent 32 years as a television journalist, anchoring every mainstream news program on ITV and BBC. He founded the UK's first internet charity, now called themix.org.uk, and he now chairs the King's Award for Voluntary Service. Now, I'm certainly keen to get to Sir Martin's presentation, so some brief housekeeping points. We'll be recording this session and it will be available to watch on our website within 48 hours. And we'll be holding a 20 minute Q&A session after the presentation. So please use the GoToWebinar chat facility to send your questions in to me, and then I'll feed them into the conversation. Now, Sir Martin, I'm pleased to announce the floor is yours. Well, Charlotte, thank you very much indeed, and I'm uh, grateful for this opportunity uh, pre presented by uh, Michael and uh, YZN to update you on a relatively new approach to journalism, which some of you will have heard of, others not, but which I believe is now on the way to becoming mainstream. It goes under various names, constructive journalism, solutions journalism, or as the BBC, yes, the BBC calls it solutions focused journalism. Here's how it works. It requires reporters sent out on a negative story to spend part of their time finding out what people or organizations are doing to tackle the problem that has generated the negative headline. Now, it won't be appropriate for every story, but journalists should at least be challenged to make the search for such interesting and newsworthy antidotes part of their natural professional behavior and instincts. After all, in order to report a potential solution, you have to write about the problem that triggered the need for that solution as well. It's not a difficult ask. In fact, it is a real win-win because it still allows editors to have a majority of headlines that are overwhelmingly negative if they so wish. But the reader, viewer, listener is not left with a feeling that the world is going down the plug hole. And with that comes a more rounded, balanced perspective on those stories. Now, I understand why the media homes in on young rioters, vandals, looters, or muggers. Of course, we need to know about those, but I do not understand why there is very little regular parallel reporting of the many young people devoting some of their time to building up the fabric of society instead of trying to destroy it. Like, for example, a 19-year-old tackling antisocial behavior and youth inactivity in his hometown of Doncaster by creating an inclusive theatre group, bringing disabled and non-disabled young people together. Or the 19-year-old girl whose 14-year-old cousin was killed in a random murder, a totally unprovoked knife attack. She wrote a hard-hitting play about knife crime, which was turned into a 10-minute film shown in schools across the country. Great story. And then there's the small local radio station set up and run a few years ago by the Oasis charity in response to riots in North London. They took young people off the streets almost en masse to work on different roles in this project. It was the idea of a local social worker. And after its first month of broadcasting, one of his colleagues went round to the local police station to ask if there had been any reduction in youth crime in that area while they were on air. No, said the police, there hasn't been a reduction. Local youth crime has stopped completely. And you know, not a single national media journalist thought that worth reporting at the time. Take a story you probably remember that had massive coverage across all media. The headline was, cases of young people self-harming rise by 50%. And surveys suggested that as many as one in every 12 young people in the UK were self-harming. The internet was blamed. But hardly anywhere did you see any specific mention of the internet sites devoted specifically to helping young people who self-harm and their families and friends. And they're certainly there, not hard for any journalist to find on Google. 
yet bypassed at the time by most media outlets in favor of graphic, gory and frightening images taken from YouTube of young people with cuts and scars. How many young people and parents worried about their children self-harming would have been hugely grateful to have been also told by the national media where they might turn for really helpful solutions to the problem. So, in the desire to shock, have large parts of the mainstream media been missing the opportunity to help, when in fact the two can and should go hand in hand? Now, the really good news is that over the last decade or so, people in different countries have been campaigning for more constructive stories like those, and there is growing evidence that they are succeeding, that the tide is starting to turn. The internet is becoming a powerful source of solutions-driven journalism. Websites like Upworthy and Positive.News present a steady drip feed of more balanced news. Twitter, now X, has admitted to, and I quote, countless proof points that uh, positive messages have more engagement and obtain more reach on our global platform than negative content. Across the UK, to fill the gap left by the closure of more than 250 local newspapers in the last 15 years, we have seen the creation of what are called hyper-local websites, almost 300 of them run by volunteers. They concentrate mainly on the positive work going on to improve communities and they're becoming increasingly popular as an expression of active citizenship. The trend has been acknowledged by Cardiff University, which has set up a specialist centre for community journalism, offering courses on how to set up a hyperlocal website to, quote, tackle the issues and promote the good. In the United States, two New York Times journalists, David Bornstein and Tina Rosenberg, launched the Solutions Journalism Network with support from the Bill Gates Foundation. Now they say that they have now trained over 47,000 reporters, producers and editors across 40 countries and have more than 100 journalism schools using their curriculum. David Bornstein explains their approach like this. We are asking journalists to use their skills to show as rigorously as possible how people are responding to problems, what results they're getting, how they're getting them, and what can be learned from those efforts. Not long ago, Bill Gates took over an entire edition of Time magazine as guest editor. He devoted it to making the case that, and bear this in mind as you think of Gaza and Ukraine, quote, the awful events in the world happen in the context of a bigger positive trend, and, quote, on the whole, the world is getting better. And he went on, this is not some naively optimistic view, it is backed by data. We are rightly shocked by the global COVID death toll, which is currently running, I think, at about 7 million. But Gates pointed out that globally since 1990, the number of children who die before their fifth birthday has been cut in half. That is 122 million children saved in a quarter of a century. And here are a few more facts that you might not have gleaned from daily media coverage over the years. In the last two centuries, average life expectancy has almost doubled to 70 years. One century ago, only 21% of the global population was literate. That figure is now 86%. As recently as 1980, only half the world population had access to clean water sources. Now it's 91%. That means that on average, every single day over the last 40 years, 285,000 more people got safe sanitation and water. Over the past 20 years, the proportion of the global population living in extreme poverty has almost halved. But in online polls in most countries, fewer than one in 10 people actually knew this. Another example, only 5% of Britons and 6% of Americans think the world is getting better. Yet in Britain over the last 25 years, violent crime has fallen by 72% from a peak of 4.5 million incidents in 1995 to just under a million incidents in the year ending in June 2023. And of course, 
each time something horrific or violent happens in the United States, as it seems to do pretty much every year, a crisis is reported. So the vast majority of people believe that violent crime there is getting worse. In fact, the violent crime rate in the USA has actually been falling since 1990. Latest figures show a 12% decline in 2023 compared to the year before. Now, admittedly, we as humans appear to be biologically programmed to pay attention to alarming information and have much of our view of the world shaped by that. But it doesn't mean we don't want a much better perspective in our daily news coverage. And I want to show you how the demand for that is clearly growing. First of all, there is more and more evidence suggesting that people now take more notice and share more stories via social media if those stories have a more constructive slant to them. In a University of Texas survey, several hundred people were each shown one of six news articles. The articles reported on three different issues, two about deep disadvantage in America and one on poverty in India. For each issue, there were two articles, one that focused exclusively on the problem and one that included identical reporting on the problem, but added detailed coverage of organizations that were tackling those problems with some degree of success. The addition of solutions content was the only difference between the two articles. Results showed that readers of the articles with solutions finished them feeling more informed and more interested than non-solutions readers. They were much more inclined to share what they read, to want to read more about the issue, and here's an important commercial imperative, to seek out more articles by news organizations covering stories in the same solutions-focused manner. And they also, by the way, felt more optimistic about life in general, carrying that attitude through the rest of their working day and week feeling that things were more possible in their own lives, a quite remarkable and unexpected result. The Harvard Business Review put it another way. It has produced evidence that consuming negative news can actually make you less effective at work, while parallel research has found that solutions-oriented reporting increases the reader's problem-solving skills and increases their connection to the community. Not so long ago, the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism interviewed 75,000 people in 38 countries, a huge representative sample. One in every three people said they now actively avoid the news, while 58% of those said they did so because it has a negative effect on their mood. And many also said it makes them feel powerless. The appetite for solutions is not just revealed by polling and by research though, it is evident in the actions many people take in their own lives. In the UK, in an average year, around 20 million people volunteer to help others in a whole variety of ways. Many annual award ceremonies, like the King's Award for Voluntary Service, which I have the privilege of chairing, offer powerful evidence of the wide range of imaginative ideas and people who drive progress at grassroots level right across our communities. For journalists, our great voluntary sector in the UK actually hands them research on a plate. Yet most of those strong potential stories are largely underreported or more likely completely ignored. Well, why? It's not as though they aren't interesting. Many just take your breath away. Like the team of volunteers who work around the clock to stop people committing suicide by jumping off a cliff at Beachy Head. The Beachy Head chaplaincy team has responded to more than five and a half thousand incidents since 2004. In one week alone, they saved eight lives. Now, what a powerful story. But it was only 14 years after they started their amazing work as volunteers that the national press decided that such endeavors were actually worth a story. An organization called Mac UK, founded in 2008, has been revolutionizing the way mental health services are provided for excluded young people, with particular success in providing street therapy for young gang members. Now, if ever there is a story for our times and the problems of lockdown, that has to be one of them. 
but no national newspaper coverage for them yet. Unquestionably, the stories are there. It just needs journalists to work more closely with the 300,000 or so registered and unregistered voluntary organisations in the UK that between them tackle virtually every single social issue imaginable. And the media in more and more countries are starting to realise the potential here. Constructive journalism has now spread to South Africa, Switzerland, Sweden, the Netherlands, Belgium and Denmark, as well as the UK and the USA. Windesheim University in the Netherlands appointed the award-winning investigative journalist Catherine Guildenstead as the world's first professor of constructive journalism. She's now moved on to help found a new journalism institute based on constructive news principles. And she argues that adopting a more positive approach actually means better journalism. She has this memorable analogy. For journalists not to adopt a positive approach is like throwing stones in a glass house, leaving all the windows shattered and the structure wrecked. We news reporters normally then leave without looking back, not always because of ill will, but because we choose new stories to dig into in the ever grinding news cycle that most newsrooms pursue. I think it's fair to say that we have a lot of shattered glass houses due to the negativity bias in conventional media. Ten years ago, Denmark's equivalent of the BBC, the Danish Broadcasting Corporation, had its news operation completely overhauled under its then executive director of news, Ulrik Hagerup, to fully embrace constructive journalism. His commercial rivals scoffed, but his news programme's ratings went up, and after six months, Denmark's main commercial channel was forced to follow suit. And what about here in the UK? Five years ago, the Guardian newspaper asked its readers what they thought they were missing and what they'd like more of. Significant numbers replied that the newspaper was seeing the glass half empty all the time. So the paper published a declaration of intent, and I'll give you just a couple of excerpts from it. It would be wrong to assume that the only things worthy of record are examples of man's inhumanity to man. While people kill each other in Syria, traffic children into Europe, beat slaves on ships in the South China Sea, or just shoot each other dead in America. Many, many more people are engaged in trying to address, fix, or circumvent the big problems of our age. The scientists trying to eradicate diseases such as guinea worm, the volunteers helping refugees, the food innovators finding new ways to feed the world, the visionaries who reject conventional wisdom and come up with different ways of doing old things. Peacemakers, carers, social entrepreneurs. If we publish more examples of people trying to do inspiring things, perhaps it can inspire us all to make our world a little better. Well, those kind of stories have already been appearing for some considerable time in the UK magazine, Positive News. Recently relaunched online and in print after being crowdfunded to the tune of £261,000 in a mere 30 days. Just let that figure sink in. £261,000 raised in just 30 days, with no huge publicity, 1,500 investors piled in from all over the world, an amazing response, and just a small indication of the appetite for this kind of news reporting. The website, by the way, is www.positive.news. Check it out. It's terrific. It's got a quarterly magazine as well. And I'm delighted to report that more and more of our national news outlets are publicly, and in some cases quietly, embracing the constructive news concept. John Witherow, a recent editor of The Times, said that constructive journalism is, and I quote, one way in which the trust in the mainstream press can be restored. So, he went on, when The Times reports the London knife crime epidemic, we spend more time explaining how Glasgow combated the equally bad problem they once had. When we cover climate change, we seek to explain which green solutions work. If we have a teen suicide problem, we look at how other countries deal with the problem and where there are hopeful remedies. And he concluded, mastering the art of constructive news can improve the image of the media because readers will begin to feel we can help them improve their lives. 
And what about UK broadcasting? ITV News runs occasional features on heroes in society. They tell me they are by far the most watched of all their stories on YouTube. The BBC World Service commissioned a six month research project to discover how young online audiences in emerging economies seek, consume and engage with news. They did that because in the last three years or so, another billion people have been connected to the internet, largely on social or mobile platforms. And the key finding was that 64%, two out of every three people under the age of 35, want news that provides solutions to problems, not just news that tells them about certain issues. So the BBC has started doing just that with a weekly world service strand called World Hacks, profiling brilliant solutions to the world's problems. A special series called So I Can Breathe looked at solutions to air pollution and another called Crossing Divides uncovered stories of how different individuals and communities are coming together to engage with one another. And examples of constructive journalism are even starting to appear in daily news programmes, like a report in the BBC main evening news on A&E waiting times, which looked at a hospital that was actually hitting its targets and asked what it was doing right. A very interesting addition to the usual media focus on the worst case NHS scenarios with patients waiting on trolleys in corridors. And only this week, Radio 4's PM programme explored how the UK Passport Office has been transformed from the worst to the best performing organisation within government. Lise Doucette, the BBC's chief international correspondent, puts this general approach simply and well. It's important to look for light in the dark. For a recent conference, I interviewed Mohit Bakaya, controller of BBC Radio 4, about his clear enthusiasm for constructive journalism. And he told me this, people are looking for a life raft for, from social media, for debates in which people try to understand opposing points of view alongside holding others to account. And he asks, can we find hope in times when things seem pretty hopeless? What opportunities can come out of crisis? And, and this is a, Lovely phrase, which seems to have great relevance in the light of what is happening in American and, and indeed British politics. Can we disagree better? And that is a key part of constructive journalism. A constructive journalism pioneer from the Netherlands called Baz Mesters summed it up well. In journalism, we have five known W's. Who, what, where, why, and when. It is time, he said, to add a sixth W. It is what now? Or as Denmark's Ulrich Hagerup put it, newspapers give us yesterday's news. Live news channels and news websites tell us what is happening today. Constructive journalism is about tomorrow. It can help facilitate debate about a better tomorrow. So in conclusion, I would argue that what is clearly starting to gather pace is a reassessment and adjustment of the way in which journalists are exercising their colossal responsibilities in a rapidly changing society. Yes, by continuing to report the failures, exposing the weaknesses and the injustices, highlighting controversies, probing motives and arguments, but also by acknowledging much more than they have tended to do in the past, the journalistically interesting accomplishments, successes and triumphs increasingly demanded by a huge constituency of viewers, listeners and readers. In doing so, that great profession of journalism is taking the covers off a much more accurate mirror image of our world where increasingly failure and success really do walk side by side. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you very much, Sir Martin. That was really um, fascinating. I th I've definitely heard before when the news is pretty bad, like it is now, um, with wars and pandemics and things, to look and natural disasters, to look for the people doing good because you can always find them. 
um, we have quite a few questions. So we'll start with Clive, who said, isn't the problem that the media are always trying to capture our attention through headlines on bad news? And what are the legal or cultural ways we can stop this and get even more of the type of positive ideas reported on that you suggest? Well, I don't think there are legal ways you can actually stop it. Uh, I, I mean, because the, you know we live in a free society, and the media is uh, you know, the media is the media. Um, but I do think, as I indicated in, in in my talk, I do think that there are commercial reasons which could drive uh, media organisations to 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 include much more positive news. We already see this, I think, with the Times, you know, and and with the BBC. What I'm not talking about is actually filling bulletins with, you know, happy, fluffy stories about why these men are growing carrots on a North Sea oil rig or anything like that. That's not what my argument is about. And I specifically rejected that in my original argument back in 1993. What we're talking about is simply getting the balance right so that alongside the negative stories, you have some really strong positive ones of people who are tackling society, society's problems. And in, in, in reporting, as I said at the beginning, in reporting those solutions, you actually have to write about the problems of society as well that those problems are designed to address. So I think it's a matter of, I think it, I've always said right from the beginning that the only way that you can make you can achieve the kind of changes I'm talking about is, is by persuading the publishers, the editors, the owners of the media outlets to actually mandate the kind of proper, sensible, balanced journalism that I'm talking about. Uh, relating to that, Ian Harris is interested to hear your views on clickbait, which seems to him to be a malign force in the opposite direction to the fascinating and positive ideas you have put across this morning. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, it's fairly ghastly um, clickbait. Um, what I would, what I would say is that um, we have a big problem with social media and the way that people understand news. Because social media, uh, on the whole, tends to be in very short sound bites and very, very short sentences and in headline terms. And if you really want to understand the, particularly the major issues that are happening in the world and are shaping the country, the world in which we live, you, you really have to get um, uh, into the grey bit in the middle between the, the you know, the, the, the the, the top headline story and the bit of the and the conclusion because it's the gray bit in the middle that gives you understanding now i don't think i don't think that uh, social media is capable of doing that in the same way that properly constructed news programs on mainstream uh, television outlets are so for example you know you look at sky news you look at bbc news at six o'clock itv at 6 30 the two bulletins at, at 10 o'clock. And those are all properly constructed news bulletins, which actually combine what the editors uh, think are really interesting stories helping to shape the country, the world in which we live. But they also are looking at stories that people are interested in as well, which might be some of the, perhaps some of the lighter stories. And I, I, I genuinely do believe that if you if you watch a mainstream program every evening or most evenings during the week, you will get a very good perspective of the news, much better than you get with a clickbait kind of approach of uh, of, of 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 social media. And I think I, I would really recommend it. And I do so at a time when the the average audience for those bulletins I've mentioned, uh, you know, for the mainstream ITV and BBC bulletins, the average audience is usually somewhere around two and a half to three million. Now, you know, there are 67 million, let's say 50 million adults in this country, in the UK, and they're all, you know, they're all getting news from somewhere. And one of the arguments that I have is that the reason why more of them are maybe not watching mainstream bulletins is because they got used to the negative nature of a lot of those bulletins. So by redressing the balance between negative and positive, I think you have a much better chance 
of increasing the audience and thus making news much more commercially viable. I think that's true. Uh, now, Hugh Purser has said this year sees the largest ever number of democratic elections around the world, yet the world seems more extremely divided in politics, society and wealth than ever. Can constructive journalism reverse this trend? Well, yes, I think it can. And I, I, I'd pick up the words of uh, you know the controller of, of uh, BBC Radio 4 when he, when he says one of his aims is, is to try to find forums in which people can disagree better. And you look now at some of the, some of the, you know, the, the almost abusive language and the hatred that is evident when people are taking opposing points of view, um, you know, particularly in America. I mean, it used to be that the political debate in America was, uh, to, to, to use a comparison, it was between 25 past and 25 to on the clock face. The difference between Democrats and Republicans. Now it's quarter past and quarter two. And the vitriol that is there is, is well, you know, it's, and, and to be honest, it's sometimes there in Prime Minister's questions in the House of Commons as well, because, you know, someone will come up with a really, really strong attack point and, and, and the other side then has to respond. And we all know that behind the scenes, our politicians are mostly sensible people who actually in private often get on with each other even though they're on opposing sides but they feel that and it's partly media driven they feel that they have to be confrontational in order to get the headlines and I think somehow we've got to find a way of giving them the headlines but 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 allowing people or providing people with the means of getting a more balanced view of a particular issue because the negative headline, uh, which which catches attention, isn't always representative of an understanding of where that story goes or what that's how that story should develop. Now, um, Simone has asked, how strong a power will the fourth estate have in providing that positive advocacy in the future when social media has not only promoted citizen journalism, but also now proliferates and promotes false narratives and AI generated reports? Um, they're speaking as a long in the tooth mainstream journalist and have always advocated truthful journalism and providing the voice that cuts through the fake narratives. But will that be enough as this is something we constantly have to work against? Well, I, I, I mean, it's a matter of keeping the good fight going. I mean, it really is. Um, I'm, um, I'm very much um, against cynical journalism. Um, I mean, I think cynical journalism is reserved for the gossip columns or should be reserved for the gossip columns. However, I'm very much in favor of skeptical journalism where you question absolutely everything. That is right at the core of, of, of good journalism. And, uh, and what, in, in the course of questioning why something is going wrong, you very find yourself coming up with, with uh, organizations and people who have identified that problem and are trying to do something about it. And uh, it is simply a matter, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, apart from uh, you know, editors and owners of media outlets mandating the kind of journalism I'm talking about, it really is a kind of drip feed. Because when I made my original speech in 1993, I was you know, roundly mocked by, a cons uh, well, not a considerable number, but certainly about half a dozen of quite senior journalists who to be frank, should have known better, and some of whom said they didn't even bother to read my speech before they attacked it. They just looked at the headlines that were being generated by my speech. And, uh, and, and that is another very sad trait in, uh, in, in, in some aspects of journalism, that uh, very often, if, if people don't, um, if people can't come up with a really good response or a good answer to an argument that someone is putting forward, you will find some journalists distort that argument in order to make it a better target to attack. Um, and that, you know, that's something else that you, you, know, you have to watch out for. It, it's, uh, um, and, and that is why coming back to a more balanced approach would give people greater understanding um, of, of, of all the major issues so that we're not reduced to headlines, but we 
actually have an understanding of the ins and outs of the arguments as well and the different and the different angles that people are coming from often depending on their very differing political beliefs We've had uh, lots of comments saying that it's a very uh, commendable initiative and a few people would like to know, do you have any data on what countries are doing this really well at the moment? Yeah, De Denmark is certainly doing it well. There is the Constructive Institute in Denmark and it's, it's worth Googling the Constructive Institute in Denmark because they will actually tell you, they've got a whole website devoted to how you can, you know, communicate with other people about the best way of getting constructive journalism up and running in your area and that's run by Ulrich Hagerup the the guy I was talking about in my um, in my speech um, and uh, um, they've also got a very interesting webinar which um, which I took part in presented most of the British section where they started at midday in uh, in Denmark and went round the world round all the countries looking at examples from journalists in those countries of constructive journalism and how it was working and problems they were coming up against and so on and so forth. And it was a very powerful program. It was a 24 hour uh, webinar. And uh, if you go into the, to the Constructive Institute in Denmark, they will tell you about that. Um, you can find out more details there. And um, and also the Solutions Journalism Network in the United States. If you Google that, very easy to find. And they have they have lots of stories. I mean, they have a raft of something like, at the last count, 120,000 really, really good stories about things that were happening around the world that would give you every encouragement to believe that the world really is better than negative headlines would suggest. Thank you. Uh, now moving on, um, Tasneem has said after decades of following the if it bleeds, it leads uh, um, theme theory really, focusing on conflict and sensationalism, how did this shift um, happen? What led to it? Right, can you say that again? I, I got the if it, if it bleeds, it leads part. How does it what? How does it how did um, the shift happen from the former focus on conflict and ses sensationalism in the news? What led to this sort of new positive approach? Well, well let me give you an example. Um, when I made my first speech back in 1993, you know, on this subject, um, there was a very famous reporter who specialised in reporting on wars. Um, his name is Martin Bell super reporter, the man in the white suit, some of you may remember him uh, by. And uh, he was coming back from somewhere in Central America at the time. And uh, I, I was back in the newsroom and I saw him coming towards me and I thought, oh, hello, he's someone who specializes in war. He's not going to like the argument that I'm putting forward. But he put his battered suitcase down and he said, he said, Martin, I, I just want you to know I'm with you 100 percent. And I said, I said, but hang on. You're, you're someone who, who makes his journalistic living out of reporting wars, out of reporting the worst in humanity. And he said, yes, he said, I do that. But he said, I quite often, after I've left a war and the war finishes, I, I, I talk to my bosses at the BBC and I say, can I go back to that country? Because I watched the disintegration of their institutions and, 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 and their country to their knees. And because of that, I understand the challenges they face in rebuilding their country after the war has finished. And he said, I'm never allowed to go back to do that. I was always sent, sent on to another war. And uh, do you know, one of, the, one of the really positive stories that I think we are going to get and which is coming up is the rebuilding of Gaza and that is a terrific story. When that starts, you will find a huge number of organizations going in there. And we'll talk about the challenges they face after the bombardment and the destruction of uh, you know, huge areas of Gaza. And, and, and then the challenges of how they then start to rebuild life for the, for the people there. And, uh, and also, you know, look at, well, you know, I'll leave it at that. 
Thank you. Uh, John Knights has asked, why do the BBC and other TV news programs always reference the daily newspapers for negative news, as these are becoming irrelevant given their decreasing numbers? Well, I suppose it's habit, John. I mean, I, I, um, I must say one of the things I really enjoy is, uh, um, you know, before I go to sleep at night, I sort of about 10.30, I hook into Sky News and uh, get the review of the of the papers, or I go into the Sky News website and, uh, and 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 there are the front pages of all next day's papers. And maybe it's it's the old newsman in me that I I, I get a sign of vicarious thrill of, thrill of seeing tomorrow's headlines today. But uh, you're absolutely right. Tomorrow's headlines are based on the news that we actually can see today, and that I think is why. Uh, certainly more and more newspapers in this country actively seek out exclusive stories for their main headline so that they're a little different from the routine news which a lot of people would have seen the day before and which make up the bulk of each newspaper so uh, um, I, I mean it's just a it, it, it's the news mill as it were you know simply going on and on and on Right, and um, we've got time for one more question. Um, Hugh has asked what advice you have for young journalists faced with an environment of persecution and indeed threat of death in many countries around the world. Well, there are some immensely brave uh, journalists uh, around the world. And uh, incredibly, the last, uh, the last time I looked at the figures, I think um, something like 200, 250 journalists are killed around the world each year. So it's, a, you know, it's a hugely brave profession to go, you know, to go into. Um, and I think that, I think that you will also find that organizations like the BBC and ITV, that they train their journalists, especially to go into what are increasingly becoming more and more dangerous um, areas and, and journalists, you know, there are some countries that just don't like the kind of freedom of expression and the journalism that we have in this country where you can properly, in, you know, here and in America, where you can properly interrogate um, issues that are happening and the way that governments are working and the decisions that they are taking. They don't like that. And we've had some very, very brave journalists in Britain who, uh, who, who have gone into difficult countries with hidden cameras and produced wonderful reports. I'm thinking of the wonderful Sue Lloyd Roberts, who was a colleague of mine at ITN, but went on to do amazing stuff for the BBC and other broadcasters, going into China and exposing elements of, you know, things that were happening there and uh, and and uh, and Russia. Um, you know, uh, there are there are a lot of brave journalists that 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 work very hard to get the news out. Um, you know, like like the journalists, uh, you know, reporting on Navalny. Um, you know, so, so, so tragically, uh, who so tragically died in uh, in, in a Russian prison recently. Um, so the important thing is that that kind of journalism has to continue. And curiously enough, what makes it easier is the internet, because almost everybody now is their own cameraman, they're their own sound recordist. You can rec you, you you know whatever you do, the minute you walk out the front door, you. Have to assume that you are being recorded by somebody, um, and 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 that's just the way, and that's just the way of the world, and that makes the world more open, uh, but it also makes it more dangerous for people who go into difficult areas carrying cameras or even just carrying carrying a mobile phone. We've had lots of uh, comments coming in saying thank you for your uplifting and fascinating talk and your uh, thoughtful answers to these questions. Um, so once again, thank you very much, Sir Martin, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. It's been really valuable. And also thanks again to everyone for connecting with us virtually and contributing to this important discussion. We have um, more le lectures coming up, um, including uh, tomorrow on urban transport in tomorrow's world. So tune in to those ones. And here's hoping for more positive news stories going forward. Thanks and goodbye. Great pleasure. Thank you.